So, well, welcome to everyone. Thank you very much for being here. I'm Mathieu from, uh, from Delpia and Co Bookshop in Paris. And, uh, you know, this year has been uh, a bit uh, particular and uh, with the cancellations of all the art fairs and the book fairs, and we were very happy to join forces with uh, Aperture and uh, Paris Photo, which we thank very much uh, for organizing uh, the, the final jury of uh, the Photo Book Awards and, and uh, organizing this series of online talks uh, celebrating the Photo Book Awards and the Photo Book Review, uh, co-edited by Del Pirenko and Aperture. So thank you very much, everyone. I will leave you now, the, the Sarah, the, the hand. Uh, we're welcoming today a roster of four international artists. Hi, June. <laughs> June is here. So June from Brazil. We have Gloria from Madrid, Spain. We have Edgar from uh, London and Sumia from Calcutta. And Sarah, it's your turn. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mathieu. Thank you for all of the support from Del Pier, from Aperture and Parry Photo. Um, it was a joy to be a juror for the shortlist. Um, for those, we let in a few people early. So if you've been here for a few minutes, you've heard me say um, that choosing a favorite photo book uh, would be impossible to me, like choosing a favorite child. But when they asked if I would like to do an event that highlighted, uh, well, they said one, and I said, how about four of the, my, some of my favorite projects. Um, I feel very grateful to have been just a juror for the shortlist and not have to pick just one. Um, when we chose it, it was taking advantage of the COVID situation and fortunately not having to worry about where anyone was. So as Mathieu just mentioned, we are really from all over. Um, Thank you to these artists for agreeing to join me. Um, the way we're going to begin is we're going to allow or ask, invite each of them to spend about five minutes presenting their project, um, speaking, uh, and then what we will after that, and they will share, each share their screen as we go through that. And then following that, we'll have a conversation where I have some questions prepared uh, for each of them, and but I've encouraged all of us to feel free to interrupt one another and say what's on your mind because there are only five of us with our microphones live. Um, and uh, we should take advantage of that. So thank you to the many people tuning in from all over the world. Uh, the chat is enabled, so uh, it is fun to see where everyone is from. Although um, I'm not going to respond to that while the artists are speaking because of course it's a special treat to get to hear each of them talk about these projects. So um, I believe we're beginning with Edgar and the rest of us will mute our microphones while he's speaking and um, let's get going. I can't wait. Thank you so much. So I've timed myself. I'll be exactly five minutes or, or, or thereabouts. Uh, so I'll, uh, I'll try as quickly as I can. So hi everyone. Thanks so much. Let me just share my screen to start with. Um, and we, we can, be, can you see my screen, all of you? Perfect. Perfect. Okay. So uh, my book is comprised of two separate publications, a, a book of images produced by me and historical archive imagery appropriated by me, a facsimile copy of the diary of an inmate I worked with in which he wrote especially for this context, and, and a film which is accessible through a, a QE code in a card supplied with the books, and all of them enclosed inside the prison an original prison, uh, prison evidence bag. So the book is presented in the utilitarian fashion you saw in the first photo, as that is how the inmates' diaries would normally be discharged from prison. However, I won't just be showing you images of the book here, but also of the shows and of the work itself, so you can get a sense of how the work moves across different platforms. So this project is titled What Photography and Incarceration Have in Common with an Empty Vase. This is, of course, a Lacanian reference. It's a fragmented, multi-layered, multifaceted body of work developed with Grain Projects and also at HM Prison Birmingham, but especially its inmates, uh, their families, and a myriad of other local organizations and individuals like charities, colleges, universities, youth groups, many of which associated with the, uh, um, with the prison. I should say from the outset that although I visit the inmates and their families in prison regularly, in their cells, during family days, during legal visits, I opted early on not to photograph inside the prison walls. So in this project, I used the social context of incarceration as a starting point to really explore the, I guess, the, the philosophical concept of absence 
So the project scrutinizes how we deal with the absence of a loved one brought on by enforced separation. So from an ontological perspective, I was interested in questions like, you know, how does one represent the subject that is absent or hidden from view? You know, photography for so long has been about a relationship with the subject it purports to represent. So what does it mean to, uh, um, you know, to, uh, uh, to, 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 for, for photography um, to have a relationship with the absence of that subject rather than the subject itself? Uh, so what does it mean for photography if it doesn't identify with its subject but with its absence? Can absence be a form of activation? Moreover, in an era of fake news, uh, you know, how can we best acknowledge the kind of fictional and imaginative dimension of our relation to photographs. So the more you know about the work, I suppose, the more you become aware of this constant tension between uh, revelation stroke documentation and concealment stroke obfuscation. So by giving a voice uh, to inmates and their families and I guess uh, addressing uh, a prison as a set of social relations rather than a mere physical space. My work tried to really rethink in, in, I suppose, counter to some degree, the sort of imagery normally associated with incarceration, which is usually revolving around themes of violence, drugs, uh, criminality, uh, and race. And even though it looks as though I'm depicting elements of violence in some of the images, uh, all is not always what it seems. So whilst I photographed offenders, ex-offenders, their, in their relatives. Um, I also photographed people enacting their stories and this methodology was employed so one would never know who is depicted in the images. And this was a way for me to really disrupt the power relations and I guess the kind of voyeurism inherent to the consumption of this type of uh, imagery. So I, I went to great lengths to avoid images whose sole purpose, in my opinion, is to confirm the already held opinions within, I guess, dominant ideology uh, about uh, crime and pun punishment. So these images represent to me uh, uh, an act of resistance. Uh, they're a counterpoint to the role that documentary photography normally plays in these ethically charged environments. Um, and I guess, you know, they seek the hidden narratives rather than the glaring truths. And many of the images talk, to me at least, about the situation of agency, the difficulty of testifying at any precise uh, uh, moment in history. And, and, I, and, and that, of course, photographs of the, I guess, the so-called other, uh, of violence, of death, of conflict, they raise a disconcerting paradox. You know, they contribute to really uh, intensifying a traumatic awareness of the subject, but at the same time, they have a, a pacifying e effect. And of course, Susan Sontag used to call these sort of a, a, an epitropaic device. But despite this, I have come to believe that there is a, a place for photography in these, uh, uh, in these sorts of environments. The point at issue is, uh, what role should it play and how should it operate? How can photographs reveal and resist at the same time? And it's in this spirit that I would like to coin a new term today, a lipograph. So a lipograph is obviously inspired in the Ulipo movement's lipogram. Uh, a lipograph is a, a visual representational device which omits its referential subject. It's the sort of proverbial impossible document. Uh, it demands, I guess, a, a strategic renunciation of the, the viewer's predisposition for, for certainty. And uh, on this basis, I'd just like to finish by uh, telling you um, a little bit about, uh, so giving you an insight into one particular image, which is this one here. So, um, so you can understand how the hidden narratives can't be understood through the images alone, but through the combination of the text, the books, the exhibitions, the talks and the diaries. So the blue rectangle featured in this image is printed directly on the glass and so it floats above the, uh, the artwork. The paint itself is used, uh, is, uh, uses a, uh, is applied using a special serigraphy process, which I developed using the same kind of paint that is normally applied in stained glass windows in churches and cathedrals. And this photograph is a homage to an inmate I met in prison. So this inmate had the darkest cell I'd come across in my time there. And although he had requested a transfer from a, uh, to a different cell on multiple occasions, the, the prison authorities were, of course, reluctant to do this because he was a very disruptive individual. So resigned that he would have to spend the rest of his 10-year sentence in this dingy dark room, he asked his family to smuggle in every month uh, and I mean smuggle like you normal smuggle drugs, a blue felt tip pen. And so for one, over one year, he collected enough pens to paint his cell window a sky blue color. So the blue that he could no longer see. And of course the landscape depicted in the background was shot in the Everglades, which is where he last vacationed with his family prior to being incarcerated. So all the images here uh, have these sort of 
personal these sort of personal stories attached to them. Uh, but of course, they're multi-layered, um, and that's my presentation. Thank you so much. Oh my gosh, Edgar, so much. I think I crammed <laughs> too much in there, but oh, you know, fantastic. Uh, I'm go when we return, I'm going to. I want to hear you. Um, that was amazing. I'm glad we recorded it because I'm going to listen to it again in an hour. Um, that was just an incredible synopsis. Thank you. Um, really great. Thank you, um, June. I think we had asked for you to go next. How does that sound? Hi, that sounds so good. Of course, okay. my computer, uh, something's going on with the internet. So I had to log <laughs> on my phone and I'm not going to be able to present except for this book. <laughs> Um, I so have I'm my, here. I was worried if you weren't going to, if you had had more trouble, I was going to try to present your book for you, but it's much better to hear you do it. So <laughs> I you. made it. I'm going to mute myself um, now. Take it away, June. So bad. Thank you so much for, for including me in this conversation. I feel so honored to be a part of this conversation. Um, this is my first book, uh, and I printed it earlier this year and it actually, released the week that New York went into lockdown. So it was a, an interesting time to, to, an interesting year to release this book. Um, so Maracuya is, um, it's a reflection on my own personal experience as the daughter of two people who migrated from Brazil and into the deep South um, and who remained undocumented for a very long time and who also brought over a lot of our family and our family friends who also share a similar status. Um, and in that dynamic, I uh, have been and was for a very long time the only person who had access to dual citizenship and so was able to return home um, in ways that a lot of my family members ha have still not been able to. Um, and so, um, you know, I'm thinking a lot about um, you know, what it looks like to be able to, you know, what a privilege it is to be able to return home within that first generation who migrated, especially um, for undocumented folks. I think uh, it's quite difficult to do. It's usually the second or the third generation. And by then, you know, things already get lost in the process of migration. But by then, you know, you have inevitably assimilated in, 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 in many ways. Um, and so I always understood the responsibility um, and, that I had to sort of nurture and protect aspects of my own family and my culture um, in, in that privilege of being able to return home. And so um, when I was thinking about doing this book, I've thought about doing it for a very, very long time. For many years, it was living in my head um, as I was taking you know, those trips home and going back to South Carolina as well. Um, the, the story that's sort of just depicted throughout the book, they're fragments from my own memories and my own perspective, um, you know, uh, seen through my lens as one person in this family dynamic. And then the images are, I was actually revisiting the book this morning, um, cause it's, you know, it's quite hard for me to do cause these, these memories are, are, are difficult, you know, to, to revisit. And so I, I, I try not to look at it too often only when I really need to, but I think that's the beautiful part of, of this book as well is that when I decided to do it, um, you know, the memories and, 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 and everything that I had experienced was, was festering in my body and like, you know, these physical uh, 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 symptoms started to occur from, from, you know, what would later be, and I would find out, uh, PTSD and anxiety. So all of these physical things started happening. And as I started, I, you know, I sought out psychiatry and all of these other things. And as, as I started to go through that process of unpacking everything that had happened in that process of migration in, you know, moving to the deep South, um, as, you know, Brazilians, I was sort of taking all of these things that was like living in my body and molding and shaping. And then all of a sudden, you know, it became this book. And now, you know, they live in my body, but they don't, they don't sit here. They can just sit in this book and this object that I can now share with other people. And not only that, most importantly, I can share with, you know, the, the new generation of, of kids that from my family that are now being born in the U S who obviously will, will always have roots in Brazil, but, you know, they're planting roots in another country. And so I, I, um, I'm thinking about, you know, what it means to have this dual citizenship and what do I do with it and how do I protect the things that I find 
to be really important about not only my family, but my culture um, and really hang on to those things. And so this book is essentially um, the beginning of that process. You know, it's like I had to acknowledge all of the things that had happened first um, in order to be able to now sort of make work and, and, and continue to unfold, you know, this experience, this understanding, this knowledge that I've gained, you know, in this process of migration and, um, you know, being part of this dynamic of a family of mixed status and new uh, people to the United States, et cetera. And it's also, I think, really representative of this, this break, right, that happened um, in my family because none of us had left Brazil before. Um, we were the very first to leave Brazil. So it's like a major break in this family unit, you know, that is now sort of being carried on in another place. And so that's what a lot of these images are. They're like very silent, still moments, I think, of someone who knows that they aren't going to stay for too long, you know, that they're going to perhaps come back one day, hopefully, but they're like the moments that I, I just had to hang on to because I don't know when the next time I'll get to experience these moments again. But there are also moments that I think if you're, you know, Brazilian, you can like relate to in, in many ways. You'll be able to see, this is my aunt, but you'll be able to see, I think your aunt in, in this photo as well. So that's, I don't know how long that was, but that's- That was perfect, yeah. that was five minutes, that was such a dream. Oh, um, and, and I have to say, um, I happen to be thinking a lot about Brazil these days because I, I myself am working on a project about Brazilian modernism and sort of what narratives yeah. have been left out of photo history. Um, yeah. But I find it, um, you know, this is a brave book in terms of how personal it is. You know, I, you and I had never met, yeah. but I feel as if I understand something about you. And so that's uh, one of the gifts of this book. So thank you uh, for sharing thank that. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think so much of the um, the whole migrating process is about hiding a lot of the things. So I'm I'm really grateful to hear that that you've been able to see something. Yeah, well, thanks to you. <laughs> I think I think we all. Can. So um, so thank. Okay, let's carrying on. Um, Sumya, I think we said you were gonna. No, who did we say was gonna be next? Gloria, were you next? I can't remember. Sorry. Okay, Gloria's next. Um, I know. So, I'm so grateful to each of you. Um, Gloria, take it away. Well, thank you so much, Sarah. And thank oh, wait, you, sorry, 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 may I just say one more thing? For those of you who didn't um, know Gloria's book, before I had nothing to do with who wins the photo book of the year, I can only pick the shortlist, but Gloria yesterday, it was announced that she, um, her book that she's about to speak about was the uh, winner of the photo book of the year. So congratulations to you, Gloria. That's, um, we're, uh, we're thrilled. So thank you. I am, I, you, I mean, I have no words. I can't express how thrilled I am. I'm like shaking and with this fire inside since last night, but thank you so much. Thank you. So, and congratulations, Esgar and June. I love your works. I mean, I knew a little bit about it, but it's incredible. Thank you. So I'm talking. I'm going to talk about my work, um, uh, "Woman Go No Gree," which I uh, mostly um, uh, developed in during an artist residence in Lagos, Nigeria. That was my third time over there, and I previously lived for three years in Mali. And it comes from my experience while I was in Mali uh, as I was like kind of frustrated watching all these uh, women that supposedly they were living in a, a ma ma matriarchal system uh, but for me there were so many injustice and, and not um, good things that I, I, I just uh, lived with that frustration for all the years I lived there. And then when years later, I realized that my reaction was wrong and I was just um, having this typical reaction of an of a empowered white and, and feminist and privileged white women. No? So that's mainly the, the starting point. And so I, I arrived to Lagos with these three books, a little more, more books, but mainly these three books that um, really uh, led me 
by the hand to all these theories, which helped me a lot to, to understand my, my own uh, position. One is the invention of women, making an African sense of Western gender discourses from Professor Oyeronki Oyewumi, male daughters, male female husbands, Farifia Madium, and wonderful, beautiful, our sister Kiljo from Ama Daido. So these three books, um, when I was in, in Lagos, I started realizing how uh, many things I was missing out uh, with my judgment of uh, what I was reading around me in, in, in all these countries in Africa that I was um, visiting or living in. And so I, I, I went into the National Museum, I worked with archives, I went to, to many other places where I could find archives, and then I, I had the, the, the chance to leave the Philabration, which is this wonderful, incredible festival which uh, celebrates Fela Kuti, which the title of the project comes from one of the, of the songs that's called Lady. Lady was uh, released in the Shakara album in 1972, that it was the year where um, uh, all these um, uh, oil uh, discoveries and, and boosted the, the, the economy of the country. So, and that point, uh, also there was this argument of if empowerment of African women had to go through the, the model of Western uh, women. So um, I talk about the white privilege, I talk about the beauty canons, I talk about um, concepts of modernity, and the third layer maybe it's the studio shooting that I did in this and um, which where I really um, take to an extreme this uh, I hyperbolize or um, exaggerate all these ideas of um, uh, the African women that we have in, in the Western societies like victims, primitive, hypersexualized, um, super exotized and and then I went into, because this book won the, the Image Vive Dummy Award, that I have to thank a lot, uh, all the jury team and the directors and the people, the team from the festival for believing in my, in my project. Uh, but the text that I included in the dummy didn't work that much. So I had one year to work on it. And at the end, I decided that I had to put myself in the center. Uh, so all the texts from the book, are there's a lot of quotes, but uh, the, the development of the narrative is mainly mine. And that's how I try to explain a little bit how I went through all the, the how the, 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 the narrative of, the, of my story, of my tale got into my head. Uh, so it was a, a big effort for me as I'm not a writer. So I just um, um, ask for a little bit of, <laughs> of um, not being so, so strict with the, with, the, <laughs> with the narrative of the text as I'm not a writer. So here I'm going to show a little bit um, some layouts of the project since 2018. Um, it's been around so at the big I started putting doing all these layouts exercise and then I I did the photo book for so for me it was a big help uh, to to construct the my my tale you know about the historic part and and well and the well the portraits the studio portraits I I print them on on as a curtain and and that's and that that's one of the. I mean, the, I did a lot of exhibitions. I have to say, I was very very lucky. And that was the one of the last ones that. Um, and then afterwards, the the lockdown came, and then since then, I showed in in Copenhagen, Helsinki, in Tel Aviv, and in Marseille, and they were all um, 
uh, they had to go out of the box. So it was another experience. And that's it. I think I, it was. Yeah, that's I, you guys are so good. I told <laughs> Leslie Martin, I was like, Leslie, I'm sure we can do it and actually also have a conversation at the end. So thank you. You know, Gloria, it's, I will return to this, but this idea of, um, I don't think I was aware of how much it had existed in physical form before it was translated into a book. So that's, that is something that I hope we'll return to, but um, <laughs> thank you. And again, congratulations. Uh, thank you, Sarah. Sarah. Thank you. Um, Zoom for us, chiming in from the time zone latest in the day, uh, almost 10 p.m., if I'm not mistaken, half hour different, so I'm not sure how that works. Um, but uh, Sumya, thank you for being with us as well. Thank you for volunteering to go last. It's an, um, not necessarily, <laughs> anyway, you are all fantastic. And um, let's, let's turn it over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for inviting me in this panel. Um, can you see my screen now? Is the visual perfect? So, well, uh, this project name where the birds never sing. This project is about a massacre happened in 1979, 31st January, uh, on the refugees who came from Pakistan that time, now Bangladesh, mostly the Bengali people who came to India and after the partition. So the, uh, the thing started from 47, the partition when happened between these two religion, Muslim and Hindu. And it was not mentioned there that if the people will move to India or if the people will move to Pakistan, if they will get the citizenship or not. But in 55, 1955, they said like, even if they move, depending on whose leaders are living where, they will get the citizenship in both the country. If they move to Pakistan, they will get the citizenship in Pakistan. If they move to India, they will get the citizenship in India. But recently what happened, this new citizenship law in India, where the government is demanding that you have to prove with your documents that you are Indian or not, or you are coming or you, are, you came later. And it's the problematic because during the partition, there's a, many riots happened. And people, in, like I, I never love to say the word refugee because my parents, my grandparents, actually I'm the second generation Indian. My grandparents also left uh, Bangladesh due to pressure from the extremist. And these are like forcefully migrated in their own, like um, forcefully they leave their own homeland just for a political reason, they partition to country. And I started working in 2000. So this is actually the starting. And then what happened when the 19, the people, the upper caste people, they moved to West Bengal and Calcutta and major city places. But the lower caste people who didn't have the money to buy land or house in West Bengal and other city areas in India, they actually depended on the government. So the government gave them a shelter refugee camp in the central India, which is a rocky island, inhospitable place, is a forest area where you are not able to get any kind of um, you know, access with the people where the city and others is very far from the city. Still now, it's a Maoist zone. And it's not at all good for the agriculture also. These people who moved in their 50s, 40s, or like in mid-age, whose profession was the farming or fishing, they don't have the option to do fishing or farming. And the government remained the Congress in our West Bengal state. So there is a party, left party, communist party. They always say that if we come to power, we'll give you shelter in West Bengal where the languages will match with you because they are coming from Bangladesh and you can stay. The new government formed and they came to power in 77. But they said, we are not ready to invite you people. But then, when I started this work, I found uh, this document, this leaflet, which was just, which is also inside the book in the English translation, distributed in 78, 22nd January, that the uh, four people, political leader who went and said like, our 10 crore people from West Bengal will invite five crore or five, five crore people with 10 crore hands will invite all the refugee brothers and sister to our state, West Bengal. And this leaflet was distributed massively. And that is why the people start coming to Sundarbun area. This is how it started. 
but the government uh, never accepted that they have officially invited these people. The book, my, my book, my first book were the birds never sing, starting with the island, the Morijapi island. And for uh, the book is for the people who departed on 31st January 1979. So this is the only image inside the book of the Morijapi island because after the massacre happened in 1979, nobody can enter the island. It's officially restricted. And government says it's a tiger is a forest, but there is no tiger at all for last more than 50, 60 years, but you can't enter. So the entire project I have to make uh, by finding the survivors from different part of India in 40 years, they moved. So I look for them, I found them and made portrait and rest and the archives I have collected from these people because same, the officially they, they were remained in power for last 30, 40 years and they destroyed all the documents. So the, all the documents I have used in my book is basically the documents I found from the survivor after 40 years. And you can see this letter 22nd January 79, seven days before the uh, massacre happened, 31st January. And the rest of the images I made um, in the other part of the island in Shundarbon, which is Rianek Mint, depending on the stories I have found from them and the listen from them. The entire book is also with the conversation between me and my survivors uh, throughout the book. And you will read the incident uh, I'm listening and how I am trying to connect with my, my past, my roots, because my family also migrate near the seaside because they can't afford to buy lands in Calcutta or in mother major cities. So I tried to connect what my grandfathers told me stories when I was growing up. And what I perceive from those stories and how I think in present scenario, what was the scenario in 79? It is very difficult to, um, to imagine such situation, what happened 40 years back before I born. So I'm in a second generation Indian and uh, trying to find my own roots by my imagination and looking for those survivors. These are the people like I uh, missing people from the, so you can see in the right side, there's a name the people who are missing from the first page of the book uh, and the age when they were the time missing. And it was like 60 names I found after 40 years, like during my research in two, three years research from 20, 2017 to 2020. And those names are in every page. So every page is dedicated to one person who are missing for the massacre. And these are like the archives, uh, I collected the people who are missing and the faces from them I have uh, used in my book. And uh, the book also ends uh, with these four pictures, my friend uh, who is the mask because people used masks went inside the forest during the police firing. And this later is, our, uh, the book is also starting with a conversation that I'm looking for a rare victim. And uh, then the book is also ending with that uh, letter of that rare victim and the letter is written, you can see 79, 7th February, which is just uh, seven days after the massacre happened. She was under height, like her family was under height. She came back and made a report to the chairman of the Udbast Union, which is refugee union uh, of that time. And this is the ending. And this is actually the paper the government is looking for, the refugee eligibility certificate, because there is no passport, no visa when they are crossing the border during the partition and during the war, 71 liberation war. It's the only certificate the government gave to the people, the survivors that uh, you will be, um, you will be like settle the places where the government won and you'll not be settled in the place where your language matches. And you will never do any kind of um, agriculture job. You've never demand anything from the government. And this certificate actually government wanting now after 70 years and many people lost it because they never, knew the importance of this paper will be after 70 years. So yeah, so this is actually uh, just about my book. Thank you so much. Um, yeah. yeah, thank you. It is, um, you know, first of all, it's very, um, I've read the book carefully. I'll say it's very moving to hear you describe the history that's embedded in it. And it, it's actually a good segue to my first question because when I was defending why I wanted to invite the four of you, um, there, there was a little question of like, well, what do their books have in common? And as anyone listening today can hear, um, nothing on some level 
And yet, uh, on another level, I think each of you does such an extraordinary job of grappling with an incredibly pressing issue, um, you know, the, writ large uh, across and, and, and then, sorry, I'm, let me think of how I'm going to phrase this. Um, each of you manages to make something that is at once a beautiful, tactile, satisfying um, book, uh, you know, a photo book where the photo, you know, Sumia, you didn't even show that many pictures of yours, but the photographs are incredibly striking and they wander between fact and fiction and recreation and sort of offering a sense of place. Um, and the and so I, I would love to hear each of you speak to like how you reconcile that quest of like how do you pick something that is important you know you i i to me at least it feels like each of you knew you were grappling with something important whether it's um the inappropriateness of applying a western notion of feminism onto these people that you sort of declare in such a forthright way on your cover gloria that i almost I almost doubted its sincerity because it was just so straightforward. You know, rarely does a book offer its own position. So what I would love to hear each of you speak to is like, tell us a little bit about the process of making the book, about who you seek feedback from, about what your goals were and how you balanced the very important issues that you want to present, but also the quest to make a photo book that is on some level deeply satisfying and even pleasurable to hold. So um, I don't know, we should, should we go in backwards order? We, or you chime in as you as you see fit. But but that idea of navigating a very important timely issue with making something that is also a work of art and carries with it the sort of unique pleasures of that. I would love to hear each of you speak to that. Should I go first? Perfect. Yeah. Thank great. you. Uh, so for me, like, uh, uh, as I told, like, I grew up in a small town, Midnapur, and my whole of my major part of my life, like, I spent here. So imagining the idea of cities and other part of the world, like, uh, most of the time, and, you know, very small, like, small family with, like, the people who came from Bangladesh and hearing the stories of their homeland in Bangladesh, what they left and what they had and what they are missing. And... When I finally went to Calcutta, and Calcutta was for me the biggest city, like when I first uh, came to Calcutta in 2010, 11, that time, like eight, nine years back. So uh, after staying there, I realized that our voices were never spoke to the people because it's always spoke for the big cities and the upper caste people always speak for them. And the point is when whenever the upper caste or the American or European or anyone who is telling Indian story, they always show us as a victim, like we are a victim of some incident. But in my story, I, if you see the images, they are the heroes of my work. Like they are my like relatives, my collaborators. I never say subject, I always say my collaborators. And I always converse with them. Like before making a work, I always show them the first book when I made, I send it to them and ask them if you're happy with the book. Like if any of images, anything you think is problematic because now is the time of internet so anyone can see their next and next generation can see the images because everything is archived in google you don't need to go to um museum where you don't have the access only the upper class has the access or upper class has the access you have the internet so it, for me it was very important to tell our story in our way as the heroes not as the victim of some incident because we are colored because we are brown and as because always if you see the picture made in 60s, 70s, 80s, as the refugees always like flash on their face and someone looking to the camera and like these people are alien or exotic coming from a different world. But no, like we are part of this world and we have to tell this story in, a, in our heroic way. So that is why, like, this is our, my inspiration. Sumia, and Sumia, I'm just, I just, in order done. to be fair to everyone, yeah. I, I would, I would love, I mean, this is the, this is the curse of having four um, incredible presenters. I would love to hear you speak more, but I do want to give everyone a chance to just sort of respond to this idea of, I mean, and that was beautiful to hear the, the feedback that you get from your collaborators, not your subjects, I think. Um, but I would also love, Edgar, I don't know if you want to go next, you're not muted, so maybe I'll ask you. 
Uh, absolutely. So, uh, I mean, I, I guess it's a, it's a, it's a, a, it's a tricky question to some degree. I mean, I've always had a recalcitrant relationship with photography. I've always seen photography as insufficient to some degree. Uh, you know, in some ways, almost a singularly inadequate medium for communication. But I still only work with photography. So the thing that I always kept, I kept uh, having in my mind was how do you go beyond what already exists out there in terms of the way in which people approach the subject matter. And again, I've been very interested in this relationship between photography and absence, partly because of the experiences I've had of loss, you know, in the last few years. Uh, and I wanted to bring an element of that in, into the work. So it was always to me about, you know, how to respond, how do you, how can you find a way to respond to uh, these challenges, you know, the sort of the restrictive elements within photography or of talking with photographs uh, and, and how do you overcome them. So I employed a whole series of metafictional uh, narratives and, and devices throughout the work to deal with that. But in terms of making the decisions, it came through a, a long process, a process of immersing myself in the environment for nearly three years, of getting to know the people, the individuals, the prisoners. I worked really, really closely with one in particular. Uh, and after that, it was a process of also with the organizations that were offering me support, like Brain, obviously working with the designers for nearly six months. It took about six months to edit the book. So it's a long process. Well, that is definitely evidenced in each of your books. Um, but uh, yeah, thank you. That's great. Gloria, do you want to go next? We'll yes, go. thank you. Well, I was just thinking that one point of in common that we have is like the gaze towards the 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 other, no, the the exotic or the or the victim or the hero or whatever you want or the immigrant or. And um, on my project, one of the main things, what, what I found in these books is that before colonization, gender was not um, um, pri the privilege in, in, in society wasn't uh, due to, to gender, more to age or to, to lineage. Or, so um, through colonization of the mind, it was also the, the concept of women, it was also colonized. And to end, uh, my conclusion was afterwards, after many, many months reading and, and trying to understand what I was talking about is that we can't universalize uh, the, the fem was hegemonic and mainstream uh, feminist discourses. And I think that maybe we can apply this to to everyone, to every project. We can't universalize every every judgment or every uh, way of, of looking to each other. And that's it because I think time is running. No, that's fine. And also I did, fortunately in your presentation, I think we also heard a little bit about how, your, how it existed physically and that was sort of instrumental in how you translated it into- Yeah, yeah. in my case, it was like that. I mean, I, I did like, I don't know, like 17, 18 uh, layouts, different layouts in different venues and different countries. and. And I was very lucky, and I won prizes, and it was like wow. And 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 then when I it arrived to make the, the photo book, I, I I it was really a good gym for me. I I really had it in my in my head. I explained it to my editor and to the graphic and to the designer and everyone. I had it like very. We had to fight a little bit between us, but it was more or less finished. A good little wrestling match can help. So yeah. Jim, maybe you'll talk a little bit about how how you envision how it became a book and sort of maybe what other what other forms or options you've considered or that you're dreaming about for the future. Yeah, thank you. Um, I was really conscious about this, you know, not being like a coffee table book because of like I think everybody's already addressed this idea of like sensationalizing these really traumatic things that happen across the board. Um, so I was really intentional about it sort of being um, kind of like a quiet thing, but also I'm also thinking about like the way that people, you know, whip out books from their bags uh, and read them on the subway. You know, I, I don't want this thing to be precious. Um, I, I want it to be like this quiet, uh, like secret that you find, like you would find, you know, an old journal that, you know, somebody wrote. Like, I hope that this cover like gets banged up and and dirtied and then it gets tucked in somewhere someone forgets about it and then finds it in like 50 years you know because that's that's um 
I think what it feels like to hold uh, a lot of the the events that happen that I talk about throughout this book. So I was really intentional about making it, you know, a, a, a reasonable size, like something that, you know, isn't going to like call your attention. It's going to be in the middle of a coffee table. It could be, but. Okay. Yeah. So no, we don't have much more time, but I'm going to ask a sort of lightning round question but to end. And here, um, and maybe June, I'm going to start with you for this one. Because in the back, you write, first of all, my copy, I'm going to keep it nice and clean, not on a coffee table. <laughs> I mean, if anyone needs a nice copy in the future, you can ask me and I'll have one. Um, but you, I want to talk about dedications, sort of to who, you know, we've talked a lot about who you're presenting in these books and your relationship with them. But June, I noticed that you wrote in the back for Rogeria and Elcio. And um, yeah. maybe each of you would just take 30 seconds to say, either actually in the book, because Sumya, you also had a dedicated, very prominent, but either who you're actually dedicating it to or in your mind to whom the book is dedicated, what, it, whether it's explicit or not. June, you yeah, want to start? No, for my yeah, no, yeah, for my parents. Yes, I love Yeah, for my parents. Is that you in the snapshot? Is that you in the car? Yeah, I'm in the, the background. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's like, we had just, we hadn't been here too long in the US anyway. We hadn't been there for too long. So yeah, for them. Um, luckily I'm so grateful that they're still here, um, and that, you know, they've been able to, to give me, I've inherited, you know, all of the things that, that, that they've been able to pass down. And this is like me trying to hold on to all of these things in like the most protective way possible. Great. Sumia, or no, Edgar, you're unmuted. So why don't you tell us about your dedication and you? Uh, I dedicated to both of my grandmothers who passed away uh, quite recently. Uh, and in fact, I should say that the previous book I published was also uh, dedicated to a good friend that sort of passed away. And, and it actually was that experience of loss that led me to actually think about a lot of these projects uh, and some of, you know, the, the dealing with sort of these themes with photography. And it's also actually also inspired the new project that I'm working on, where I'm actually going to Libya to sort of retrace his steps. He, he, he was a friend that uh, was killed in Libya during the Libya war a few years ago. That's interesting. So Sumya, I kind of gave it away about, or did I say who yours was dedicated yeah. to? Yeah, okay. my both grandfathers like who died uh, and like the stories I got from them, what I'm working now. So yeah, I'd love to but, dedicate it. But also to I'll, I'll just say. Yeah, for the old people like who departed. And I, yeah, it's already mentioned in the book, but yeah. in my mind like, Okay. The story is starting from my grandfather's, like from whom I got to know about all this. Um, and Gloria, and, uh, what about you? Uh, I have two minutes. Oh my God. You can answer a different question if you want. <laughs> or you no. can talk about no, I mean, I have, I, I didn't think of, I mean, I don't, I can't dedicate it to, I mean, I, I have to thank so many people that were with me on the process. And of course I could dedicate it to all these women that wrote those books. And that's it because I mean, they've been like screaming out loud what is not evident for us. So I just invite, I, at the end of my book, I put a long list of, of video, I mean, films and, and novels and whatever. And that's all the things that I, company and films and so just to all these people that are fighting for, for to change our hegemonic view that's it yeah well that's a beautiful way to end because i think all of us do want to fight about against this and each of you have made something that is both an extraordinary artistic treasure a pleasure to hold and uh, really helps get at some bigger issues that um, that was why we believe in the power of photography. As um, so, thank you all so much. Thank you, Del Pier, Aperture, Perry Photo. Mostly uh, thanks to the artists. Thanks to everyone who gathered uh, with us. We had a great uh, turnout. Um, I hope we can preserve the chat. There were some incredible comments there that we didn't even get to turn to. And um, I guess. Mathieu, do you want me to say, stay tuned, because in 10 minutes there's going to be another one, or should I leave that to you? Yeah, sure, stay tuned. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, right. everyone. Um, Thank you, Sarah. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you all.